Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Uh, welcome to uh, another postdoc talk. Um, today we have Mike Anani from uh, Stanford, who's in the Department of Communica Communications, who I actually went to grad school take one with many, many moons ago, um, and who is also kindly going to go through this talk um, having not slept since his flight was canceled yesterday, and therefore he had to do a red eye. But hopefully that will just make him more deliriously entertaining. <laughs> um, so without, without more, uh, Mike, thank you. <laughs> okay. <coughs> Thanks a lot, Dana. Yeah, I was on the red eye with a guy sitting beside me who was designing circuit boards for the whole flight and sort of moving around and the lights on and everything. So I, I, I had uh, a lot of exposure to technology as I came here. But um, yeah, I was I was thrilled to get an invitation to come visit. I was um, sort of admired a lot of the stuff that's been going on here for the last couple of years and was thrilled to get a chance to come and talk with you today. Um, what I wanted to do today is do something. Um, Sort of this, my attempt at a little bit of a retrospective um, on work that I've done in the past and how I've been grouping it under this idea or this theme called systems for listening. So I'm going to talk about some different projects that I've done, but try to fit it into this framework called systems for listening. And I'll explain a little bit more about what that is. Um, <coughs> I should apologize, the, it's a little bit washed out. I've been told for the camera it needs to be that bright, but uh, I think the contrast should be okay as we go along. But let me know if there's anything totally unreadable. Um, so the, these systems for listening that I'll explain what they are in a minute are basically coming from sort of my last three phases of, of professional homes or sort of institutional homes. Um, as Dana mentioned at the MIT Media Lab where I was working with uh, Professor Justine Cassell in the Gesture and Narrative Language Group and Hiroshi Ishii in Tangible Media um, and then went to Media Lab Europe and actually a former colleague of mine, Jamie, sitting in the audience here, uh, working with a group led by Carol Strohecker called the Everyday Learning Group. And then finally my work, the dissertation work at Stanford uh, in the comm department where I've been really been looking at some kind of different ideas. It's less of a technology building and uh, design environment and a little bit more of sort of a, a more traditional research environment. Um, so there's three systems that I want to talk to you about today and hopefully get a chance to explicate or sort of expand on what I mean by systems for listening. The first is this, this little guy here called Telltale, which was my master's project, which was about how to let uh, young children compose oral stories in a way that might be like how they'll eventually create written text. Um, so think about that when you think about this idea of systems for listening. The second is this one, um, Jamie will recognize this, called Text Tales, which was again sort of a different take on what I mean by a system for listening. Instead of a in a one-on-one uh, -on -one children language play kind of toy setting, it's actually more of an urban public setting and thinking about what public opinion means as something that develops um, outside of polls and surveys and questionnaires. So that's the second one. And then this third one, this is the, this is the totally unreadable graphic, but I can go, go into that later on. Um, but this third one is my dissertation work, which is actually taking, again, sort of bumping it up a level of analysis and thinking about listening as something that happens not just among individuals and not just among groups that are physically located, but something that actually has sort of an institutional characteristic to it and has a professional component to it. So we're sort of, if you can think about these as sort of bumping up different layers of analysis from an individual play setting to an urban group setting to sort of this distributed institutional setting. I'm specifically focusing on the American press in my dissertation and for reasons that I'll go into um, a little bit longer. Although the press is something that is increasingly um, crossing different uh, national boundaries. Um, so what I, what I mean by systems for listening, um, this is a little bit wordy, but I, what I'm gonna try to do is unpack this for the time is, a system is not necessarily just a technology and it's not necessarily just a practice, but it's a combination of technologies, practices, norms, and ideals that let individuals, groups, and publics represent, reconfigure, share, and judge meaning. Um, and I know this is a little bit dense, but sort of the goal of this talk is to sort of unpack that and show you how I've approached that in these last few talks. But the core idea is this idea that listening as an activity, and this is a little different from some of the, uh, I think, work that's emphasizes speech as an activity, is listening is something that's distributed among different kinds of sites. And it requires, I think, this multi-sided approach. And that's what I'm going to show you as well. 
Um, so these three sites that I'm going to talk about, one is child language play, and the other is this idea of urban public expression, and the uh, third is institutional publishing. Um, I should say jump in with questions at any time, but it's just sort of setting the, setting the framework here. Um, so the first, the first system I was working on was really centered around this idea. This it was a design research question. I can go a little more detail about why, what I think is different between design research and some of the research that I've been doing. Um, at Stanford, but this is part of the master's um, project at Media Lab. The question was really, how can young children develop written literacy skills during oral language play? We usually think of literacy skills as something that kids develop starting, written literacy skills as something kids develop sort of five, six or so as they're just sort of starting to experiment with, you know, in past times, holding a pencil and figuring out what it means to um, construct words and sentences and language uh, in that way. Um, but what I was sort of interested in doing was saying, well, maybe there's some core underlying composition skills, some, some principles of uh, psycholinguistics, psychology of language, that you could actually start a little bit younger, but if they had the right kind of interface. And so it's a question of what does that interface look like and how would you evaluate that? Um, and that process of interface construction kind of, you know, is in a very sort of media lab-esque approach, you know, was a lot of sort of brainstorming, a lot of uh, quick prototype production, a lot of sketches and mock-ups to sort of get an idea of what the form factor would look like and what the interaction design principles might be. And then sort of settled on this, um, this guy here, this was version 1.0 called, called Telltale. Um, but the, throughout this sort of design exercise, um, what I ended up sort of deciding upon was that the audio that the children were going to be creating, because again, that's this goal of oral language play, the audio needed to be structured in some way and it needed to be uh, relational, it needed to relate one piece of audio to another piece of audio. Um, so I chose this sort of linear non-branching um, form factor that's like text and I can tell you. So after we, after I built this one, which was totally not robust enough for testing and was sort of a very, you know, stuck together with glue and tape for the demo show and then, you know, almost immediately fell apart afterwards as some people have seen uh, seen demos at, at the Media Lab can sort of attest to. There's sort of this big push to get it together and then, you're, uh, and then it's done. What I wanted to do is build another one that was a little bit more robust for testing afterwards. So that's the second version that you're seeing here. And basically the way it works is that each one of these little body pieces here had uh, 20 seconds of digital audio inside it. So you'd press this button, actually that one right there, record a little bit of audio into it and uh, I was working with kids as young as age three, but up until the age of about eight. You'd record, record a little bit of audio. It would be, you know, one day I went down to the river and, you know, Susie and I were playing and splashing the river and we had a great old time. You'd record about 20 seconds into that. You could play it back at any time with that little button there. What you'd do is you'd record for each one of these body pieces and then uh, chunk them together press this little button on the nose here, and the audio would flow down in the order that you'd constructed it in. So that's kind of the way that it that worked. And for the user testing, what I uh, ended up doing is sort of creating this, um, I got a lot of people made fun of me. I had, in my office was filled with leaves for a little while because I was actually trying to create a uh, landscape where kids could actually move Telltale across the landscape and telling stories with it. The idea was to turn my office into a little bit of a playpen for you know the time that I was doing it. And, took a little bit of ribbing for that. Um, but this was sort of the setup, was to say, okay, here's uh, an interface that has a bunch of sort of interaction design hypotheses around them. Here's a context in which kids might work. Whoa. Um, oh my goodness. I, did, I was warned not to do that too. Um, and then see how that might, um, might be tested. So the technology here, again, going back to this idea of a system for listening and what that is and sort of trying to develop this framework, the technology here was this self-recorded, reconfigurable, structured audio. So that was the, the technology that I was making. The practices that I was investigating, the kind of uh, listening practices that I was hoping this tool, think about it as a technology that listens, is this shared language play and really grounded in storytelling play. And the I ideals that I can talk about a little bit uh, more in some findings that I had. One is just, it sounds like a simple notion, but that play is this opportunity for language learning and to see how we could inform uh, interface design with that. Um, I, I might sort of skip through this a little bit, but there's some sort of developmental linguistics theory that this is resting upon, which basically says that, you know, 
literacy isn't this thing that you just acquire at a certain age, but actually there's this continuum of oral and written language development, and we move, kids move in and out of that as they go through uh, different stages, and that composing really language is this um, activity of creating and structuring and editing uh, language. So there, there is a lot of um, sort of good psychological liter literature, but nobody had really looked at whether or not kids could do some of these things at an earlier age. So that was the attempt here. Um, so moving on kind of quickly to, uh, to evaluation. So the, f the first step of the evaluation that I wanted to look at was, so it started with this idea that, you know, structured audio kind of mattered for this idea of composing oral stories, right? So there's this, that's the reason there were a whole bunch of different body pieces, that there's not one big chunk. So what I wanted to do in evaluating the interface was to say, well, does the segmentation thing matter? You know, as, a, as an interface design principle, does it really matter that much? So as I mentioned, there were 20 seconds in each one of these body pieces. Um, so this is the interface that has, you know, five of these, that nose button, nose guy doesn't have any audio inside them. But what I wanted to do then is to sort of create a control. So I had uh, made one body piece that just had 100 seconds of audio inside it that you could record into. So setting up, trying to just a simple comparison where the only thing that's differing here is the same amount of audio being distributed among body pieces. And then wanted to see, do kids' language play, is it different? Is it, have I affected this in some way? Um, and, and the answer was, was yes, but in, in two senses. The first one is, so, Conjunctions, uh, English language, things like and, if, or, but, kids' uses of conjunctions is a signal of later uh, literacy development. So as kids start to use these uh, words, they're sort of relating chunks in their oral language with you. So we know from a lot of good, study, uh, good psychological studies that the more kids do that, the more they're sort of on this road to complex language development. So what we ended up seeing here was, so unified telltale is this one that has 100 seconds of audio inside it, right? Segmented telltale is this one that has 100 seconds split across five different body pieces. And what we saw was that kids were using more conjunctions per word. So they were using and, if, or, but, so, you know, these ways of relating language to each other. And the only difference there was, um, was the structure of the interface. So it seemed to matter that kids were mapping their um, use of conjunctions onto this distributed um, interface. The other sense in which segmentation matters is that it seems to help planning. So it seems to help kids think about what it is that they're going to say. And this idea of a false start is another marker of sort of more complex language ability. So if I start and I say, oh, oh and then I stop and, oh, wow, well, you know, I'm false starting repeatedly. I'm starting with an idea, not finishing it, and having a difficulty following through on it. What we found is that the number of false starts, the average number of false starts per word in the unified section were a lot greater. So kids were having a hard time working with 100 seconds of audio. It seemed like 100 seconds was sort of too much audio to work with, and that maybe something uh, in the neighborhood of 20 seconds was more appropriate. Yeah? The segmented version. So the kids are allowed to pick up one of these balls, yep. record into it, and then that's it? Or can they, if they decide that this is a false start, they didn't get it right? They back up and rewind. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So they could record as, as often as they wanted with the body piece. And there's a lot of evidence that kids were doing that as well. So I was transcribing not just what made it into sort of the final recording of what the kids pieced together, but also um, their, yeah, their. Uh, yeah. Rather than, uh, yeah. The end product. yeah, exactly. So sort of even, even the act of working with this. Um, it, it was um, between subjects, so kids didn't see both, um, didn't see both interfaces. They were only working with one. But even just having it there was was the difference. Um, this is sort of a, a different take on uh, asking again about listening technologies, but in relation to this, this is one other sort of way that I was evaluating this. And remember, in the in the values. Uh, section when I was talking about listening technologies, or listening systems as having this technological approach, uh, practice-based approach, and values-based approach. One of the big issues as well um, in kids' language development is this difference between kids of lower socioeconomic status and kids of higher socioeconomic status. And one is um, sort of an empirical claim of just asking whether this difference exists is sort of one. And then there's um, 
sort of more of a normative approach, which is sort of saying, well, what can we do to perhaps change this uh, difference and, um, and help sort of even these things out? Um, so what I did uh, was, uh, I can go into more detail in the Q&A maybe, but was comparing kids from this high SES versus low SES uh, backgrounds. And there's, there's just a few things to pay attention to here. Um, but the critical idea is to say, can you actually see differences with this interface? Um, so can it become a tool that you might use to diagnose different kinds of uh, language differences between kids of high SES and low SES? There's a, another story to tell about how kids of low SES tend to actually use language in a way that looks like things called language um, learning disorders, LLDs. Um, there's some, I think there's some ideological problems with sort of casting low SES kids as akin to language learning disability. But the point is that um, this interface was trying to actually just empirically get at changing or uh, showing those differences. So the one thing here is just to say, um, this is a story component. Kids were from low and high SES were using it to record stories. So this is kind of a baseline measure to say, are we working with the same kind of material here? Yes, it's sort of this narrative material storytelling. Um, kids from the high SES, remember I mentioned these connective phrases like and, if, or, but, so, things like that, tended to do a better job of putting connectives at the <coughs> beginning of their, uh, of their story, of their body pieces, and then also connect, putting connectives at the end. So one is that they were actually establishing coherence with previous language that had already been recorded in a body piece, and the other is they're planning for future occurrences, and you can sort of see that in how they were doing it. Um, and the, the final bit is these were kids that were playing together co-occurring utterances. The kids from the high SES, um, this means talking over each other. If two kids are playing together, how much are they doing turn taking versus how much are they talking over each other? Um, we tended to see uh, the kids from the low SES just talking over each other a lot more. Um, yeah. Okay. You know, I didn't. That would be really because then interesting like, to know, see. The false start or something would be interesting to see if adults also have a lot of false starts. Absolutely, yeah, yeah, and I think that would be a, a totally uh, interesting approach to take. Um, so yeah, sorry. When you say listening technology, is that the same as an audio technology? I mean, something that depends on voice and so on, or is it something else that I should? Be? Yeah, so it's actually a good question. I mean, in this case, it was audio, but I mean listening in a little bit more of a conceptual sense, and that, if I can kind of be bold, that actually is kind of a segue to the next. Uh, system that I wanted to talk about, but yeah, but yeah, sorry. Question. Why are you calling this listening? It sounds like it's production, not listening. Well, I, it's a good point, and I maybe I'll, I'll ask to save that to the end because I go across the different uh, projects. But but it's a, a valid point, and it's something that I'm still working out. Um, so I'm going to skip then, just given these last two questions, to this next um, iteration of what what I'm calling this listening technologies, or listening systems, sorry. Um, this is thinking about listening in a slightly different sense. It's thinking about not just audio that's coming in, but it's thinking about how do you actually hear, comprehend, and uh, understand in some fashion the public opinions of groups that you may not normally get to meet. So this is not listening in a sort of an audio uh, perception kind of way, but this is in more of a semantic meaning kind of way, is figuring out how to, to listen to individuals. This is a project that I did, well, it's a little out of focus, but a um, project that I did while I was at Media Lab Europe, and it's called Text Tales. Um, actually, I just want to, yeah. Um, Text Tales was a project um, which was basically doing these large uh, urban projection displays, did them in uh, public squares, in train stations, in community centers. But the things that were being displayed is this, this interface here. Um, this is just giving you a sense of some of the activity that's around it. But the thing that was being displayed is, is this. I just want to tell you exactly what the interface is for a second and then talk a little bit about how this interface came to be. Um, <coughs> what you're looking at here is a grid of, of nine images. Each one of these images came from a uh, community engagement process where I and other people from Media Lab Europe um, worked with local communities, and I'll tell you which communities those were exactly, 
to basically take pictures around some topic that they cared about in their community. So we would distribute disposable cameras. This is before digital cameras were, were as inexpensive as they are. Distribute disposable cameras and ask people questions like, show me something in your community that you care about. Uh, show me something that you love about your community. Show me something you'd like somebody standing here 100 years from now to see about your community. Or show me, show me something you'd like to change. These are sort of very broad, open-ended questions. And I, I worked with a, a photojournalism school in Canada to actually design these questions and figure out what they look like. But the idea was, how would you elicit people's descriptions of their local neighborhoods? Once we had those pictures, again, this is a sort of a participatory design exercise, we arranged these images into this collection, this grid, and each one of these captions underneath the image um, is a caption that was created by somebody sending an SMS text message from their phone when they were projected into these uh, public displays. So what you would do is you'd wander, you'd see this big display. Um, you know, so here's a case. We did one in this uh, Dublin Meeting House Square uh, projecting onto different kind of uh, surfaces on the ground. Um, what you do is you come upon it, you decide a picture that you wanted to create a caption for, you just compose a text message that had the picture number, uh, put a space in, and then have the caption that you wanted to create for the picture, and then about 10 seconds later or so, it would appear up on the screen, on the interface, and it would appear in. And what ended up happening is you ended up getting hundreds and hundreds of text messages. We would tend to leave the installation up for sort of two to three nights, depending on the location and depending on the community. You get hundreds of text messages coming in that were both sort of commentary on the images that they were seeing, but quickly broke out into these sort of conversational um, actions where people were having little conversations with each other through text messaging um, underneath, the, uh, underneath the pictures. And actually, the, the other thing I'll say actually is the conversation as well, and this is a, a point about like, thinking about a listening system. Conversation happens sometimes in the physical space around the interface. Uh, so in the meeting house square, in the train station, wherever. But it also happens sometimes on the screen and uh, projected up. And there's, there's another difference of thinking about what parts of a conversation do we want to be having face to face and what parts of the conversation do we want to be having um, represented uh, on the screen. But here, um, you know, trying to bring it back here, and this is, you know, this is an attempt here to sort of try to develop this idea of a listening system. So what I'm trying to do here is say, here are the technologies with this interactive display of images where we were asking communities to figure out what it would mean to listen to themselves, figure out what it means to create an installation that started with these broad concepts and then later on identified issues or patterns. Some of the practices that we were using here was sort of this participatory design, starting with broad issues. Uh, I worked with, uh, it's multi-generational, we had kids and grandparents um, all across the community doing it. But the, the basic idea here is to think about public opinion as an opportunity for public debate. So it was trying to push on this idea that public opinion isn't just polls and surveys and questionnaires and thinking about public opinion as a static thing that you go in and sample and that you measure, but trying to think about what the space would look like where you could actually develop uh, perspectives on particular issues, um, starting with something very broad. So it's more of a, a discourse space than anything. I think I sort of said most of this already, but this is kind of the process that I followed for each one of these installations. And it gave me a chance to think about, again, you know, listening is something that happens not just in this play setting in my, in my office that had been designed like, like a playpen, but something that was happening across. Sorry, yeah. Are they trying to come to a consensus? Are they trying to gel some concrete things which are then going to be publicly displayed as opinions of this community? Yeah, exactly. So, and that's kind of this, this fifth point here. Oh, yeah, exactly. So I was, and, and it's, it's an interesting point because it was a, and I, I wrote a little paper on this that I can distribute on sort of thinking about what kind of participatory design this was and what my role was, sorry, what my role was as the designer and as the leader of this project and what the community's role was as sort of the appropriator and the user of, of this uh, system, where system meant technology plus process. Um, but it kind of an answer to your question too, what, what were they getting out of it? These were the four different installations that we did, and they were sort of chosen f each for particular reasons. The first is Fatima Mansions, which was this, um, Jamie remembers it, is this very um, uh, 
a, a very rough place in Dublin that was actually undergoing a lot of transition. So there were a lot of, um, had some of the highest uh, per capita drug use in Dublin, had some of the uh, highest instances of teen pregnancy, lowest instances of people finishing sort of the, the equivalent of American high school, uh, apartments that didn't have heat in them. Um, it was built in the 50s as a way for the Irish government to get people from living in the rural settings and bring them into urban centers. And it was sort of this massive relocation project of taking people from uh, rural centers and bringing them into this urban setting. And kind of a, as an experiment um, in urban planning, is a total failure. And it was just, it was a really place of pretty abject poverty. Um, they were in this uh, pretty heated debate with the Dublin City Council and the Regional Development Agency about what the redevelopment would look like of this area. So there was a lot of money that was being promised about what could happen to Fatima Mansions, this, this housing complex. But one of the things the community lacked was kind of a, a voice around what this might look like or a way to articulate some kind of future. So the Dublin City Council, here the issue was pushing on, Dublin City Council had already gone in and done surveys. They'd knocked on these doors and they'd said, you know, would you like a playground? Or would you like a community center? Or would you like a swimming pool? And people were like, well, I, that's starting the conversation way too late, you know, or uh, too far ahead. We don't want to just sort of have a list of different amenities we want in this um, uh, housing complex. There's something more about the character of this, about what it means to be relocated, about what it means to relate to each other as a community in this sort of um, impoverished setting. So as an answer to your question, sort of say, oh, here's one way that you could start to have that public conversation is this image text. Um, the big, big smoke was this, uh, Dublin was going through a smoking ban. So they were uh, banning smoking in pubs and restaurants. Um, so this was an installation to sort of engage the general public in Dublin and say, well, what do you think of this ban? And what are the issues around health and safety and risk? Um, and a follow-on one was in Amsterdam which was called Smokem, which was uh, with the computer clubhouse in Amsterdam, if you know the network of computer clubhouses, um, where they were wanting to engage, they approached me actually and said, we want to figure out what it might mean to query young people around what smoking behavior is and figure out what kinds of images and texts uh, we could have that conversation with. And finally, this last one was C-Text in Kiel Kiel, which was um, a pretty bitterly divided community in Northern Ireland between Catholic and Protestants where there was a, a lot of violence that was happening um, in the community. Very few opportunities to let the different uh, factions be able to come together and have any sort of common space where they were uh, talking with each other. This was a project that was partly sponsored by the BBC and partly sponsored by the, the local Catholic uh, Republican organization um, to say what would it mean to just describe our community, you know, full stop. So, um, so it, that gives a sense of sort of what these communities had in it for them. In a sense, that there's these very different kinds of conversations that they didn't seem to have systems for letting them have the kind of conversations they needed to have at this phase of development. Um, there's a few different kinds of evaluation that happened for this project. Um, and there's a paper that I can distribute that goes into more, more detail on this stuff. Um, what, this kind of evaluation, what I wanted to sort of talk a little bit about is what an interaction pattern was that emerged. So we built this system, built the technology, had some idea of what listening might mean in this context. Um, and then it did, did an analysis afterwards, both sort of a, a, sort of a rapid design ethnography kind of analysis in the moment, um, trying to talk with people and figure out what it was they were doing, and then some qualitative analysis afterwards about some of their interaction patterns. But the one was this idea of intermodal conversation starting, which is a little clunky, but it was basically saying, in this system, images and text were equally uh, spurring conversation, starting conversation. So people would end up responding to something in the image, they would end up responding to something in the text, but there was this kind of interplay between um, these two media. The other was this idea of authoring for unfamiliar audiences. This seemed to be something that emerged, emerged as well. So when you're in, you know, this guy here, I don't know if it's, you can sort of see, basically you'd wander by this installation and you didn't necessarily know who had come before you and you didn't necessarily know who was going to come after you. You didn't even necessarily know who the identities of the people who had participated in uh, in, in the past, but often what happened was people were trying to figure out how to phrase questions or how to phrase captions for images that would be both specific to something that had previously come in the image, 
um, but also broad enough that anybody else wandering by could see it. So that's the difference between thinking about um, sort of a public as something that's a little bit sort of ad hoc that shares this physical setting, but it also shares this relationship to a conversation that pre-exists. So you're entering into this conversation and then you're figuring out how to leave it. Um, kind of relatedly, there's this idea of this, this public versus private messaging. Um, what happened is here we, we saw a lot of times people shifting between anonymous and attributed kinds of text messages. Some people would leave their phone numbers within the captions they submitted. Some people would sign them. Some people were sort of crying out to be uh, contacted after the fact. It wasn't just about dropping something into a, a public display and sort of having your moment of participation, but it was saying, contact me later. Um, this uh, sort of idea of screen versus face-to-face, -face, um, I have an example of it later, but there were lots of moments where the conversation happened in the physical space in front of the installation and kind of ignored the display, what was going on. People, something happened in the display and then you know, you know, 10 or 12 people would be chatting with each other. Other times it would shift back up onto the screen. So it would actually be this kind of space where people would um, not necessarily talk to each other in a, in a physical face-to-face -face setting. And finally, I can talk a little bit more about, about this, but there's a whole kind of... Uh, practice around what it means to frame and edit and censor dialogue. So we did have a lot of, um, a few moments where the group of designers that I was working with decided to actually shut down the interface for a couple minutes. We looked through the log file collectively to figure out what it was that had sort of offended people who were sitting in the physical area. The same with the, the one that was sponsored by BBC. Um, because it became a BBC production, it actually fell under BBC Northern Ireland editorial guidelines, which are kind of, in, um, they're very difficult guidelines to work with, specific, specifically because they're trying to cross sectarian divides. So if you ever watch BBC News in Northern Ireland, um, there has to be an equal number of mention of a uh, loyalist uh, Protestant perspective on an issue with a Catholic Republican perspective on an issue. And you'll see newscasters flipping back and forth within a single news story. Um, even the town of Derry, you know, if you're Irish, you call it Derry. If you're from the, from the north and you're British, you call it London Derry. So you'll actually see people f switching back and forth. This is an incredibly difficult thing to do. The BBC producer said to me, well, can you guarantee that at any given moment the screen will display an equal amount of, you know, Catholic material and Protestant material. I said, no, I can't do that at all. But we had to figure out what it meant. We actually ended up designing a little buffer zone. So the text would come in. We'd go through this process of editing, um, reading the texts and editing them and deciding as a group within the space of like 60 minutes, or 60 seconds, sorry, um, whether or not this was a text that we wanted to allow up onto the screen. So, sorry, yeah. Maybe this is awesome. So I, w I would have thought that some people would just put up random text messages, you know, high bulb or whatever. Uh, did you guys edit that out or did you leave it up there? Or was we tended to, the default was sort of to leave things up there. Um, it was a pretty narrow set of um, text messages that we would delete. There was one case in Dublin in Meeting House Square where there was some um, sort of very personalized um, pornographic commentary that was directed toward one person that we, we took out really quickly. Um, the BBC um, stuff in Northern Ireland, a big issue was, I mean, there, there are bombings that happen regularly in this town. There's a lot of sort of vendettas and hits out. So there was a concern of, is this just going to be a place to sort of um, cultivate sort of a, a violent um, kind of culture? So that was one of the big things we were looking for. And that actually didn't happen. And there's a, a longer story to tell about how you put these installations into public spaces and work with communities as a way to sort of guard against some of that um, kind of behavior. But we um, can talk about that later. Um, so anyway, these are, s oh, sorry, yeah. Um, sorry, there's a couple <laughs> questions. I think I saw you first, sorry. Did people show any behavior sort of saying, like, I value this message, I want to keep it on the board, so maybe I'll post the exact same message again? <clears throat> yeah, totally. That's what happened. I mean, there's a sort of echoing um, res uh, behavior that happened where people would say, um, well, there's two things that happened. So one is people would say, you know, yeah, great, you know, totally agree, you know, various takes on that. Um, but the other is, if you remember, you know, these three, it only showed the three most recent lines of text. So, yeah, exactly. So that was another little thing that would happen is sort of you'd get, so, you know, this is the, the oldest one and this is the newest one. What would happen sometimes is there'd be this old one that people thought, wow, that's a great caption, you know, it relates to the picture really well or it sort of seeds the conversation really well. Something was valuable about that. People, you'd see the number of 
texts to that image plummet pretty quickly. And uh, just from you know talking with people in the physical space around it, there are people that say, "No, I'll leave that up there. You know, don't text anything in number six. Leave that up there." Um, and then it's a case of sort of you know what what ended up happening there. There's another moment of going from like screen-based conversation to physical urban conversation. Uh, conversation in the urban space was that you, people would tend to talk about, well, why did you think that was a valuable caption? Or what, what was it about it that you know, makes you not want to text back up there and, and keep it there? So yeah. Sorry. So this uh, process of putting up images and having various comments going around them and what happens on Twitter all the time. Mm -hmm. um, and I wondered what you think are the, are, are there substantial differences um, in the tools and that led to differences in behavior? Yeah, no, it's a good point. I mean, I would say the the big one is this distribution of conversation between physical and screen space. So if you just looked at the record of what was happening here in terms of the log files afterwards and the pictures and the and you could play a little movie afterwards and see how the you know the night progressed, um, you'd only be sort of getting part of the story of what happened. So I think it's a you know, it's a really valuable corpus of data and it's also a really valuable set of experiences that people had on there and they they talked about that and I would actually get I got text messages from people later on from their phones saying like you know was that your installation last night way to go great you know thanks loved it but um, so we there was that um, um, sort of uh, digital conversation that kept going afterwards but there was also a ton of stuff that happened in the physical space that just didn't didn't go anywhere so I think it's kind of an it's maybe a sort of a design jumping off point is to say, you know, how do we distribute conversation among these two? Yeah. Um, Sorry. Um, I wonder if, you know, you tried to study whether uh, if you had left 10 messages on the screen, there would be a sort of a more of a collective memory developing. Uh, yeah. Three. It's a really great point. I didn't, I didn't do that. Um, one of the things we were, excuse me, um, one of the things we were playing with is you know, was nine images is a, a little arbitrary. Um, whether or not images that uh, were receiving more attention should maybe come to the foreground and get a little bit more screen space as they're coming to the, you know, coming to the forward. There's there's stuff that we, we could have done in that respect too. Um, one thing I was a little concerned there was the sort of this echo chamber phenomenon of sort of, um, you know, rewarding with screen space the conversations that were really popular. Was that going to create this little feedback loop that maybe wasn't in line with what we wanted to have happen. But yeah, you're right. I think there's a, there's a ton of sort of design elements here that could be experimented with. Sorry, yeah. Yeah, no, it's true. Um, I, don't, I don't know. I haven't studied Twitter well enough to say that I've seen those physical um, instances. I mean, moments when I have seen it for sure um, are especially, you know, settings like these where, you know, somebody decides on a hashtag and then, then there's a certain amount of, and I've been in lots of situations like that where you, if you're following um, the stream of tweets, there's a conversation that's happening there, but then if you've got your other ear open to what's happening in the room, there's another conversation happening in the room, and you do, I think, see stuff, um, stuff, messages that are distributed in different ways. Things that I think people are, you know, Maybe willing to say on Twitter that they're not willing to say in the room, but also vice versa. Thinking about sort of you know whether it's being recorded, where the um, where the record is going to go. So yeah, it's in there. sorry. Go ahead. Do you see any behaviors that are like that in your text tales? Um, well, I'll see. And actually, maybe I'll. It's a, a segue to a, an example that I mentioned earlier that I did want to show. Um, I'm going to skip. This is. Okay, this is, I think, getting at your question, but let me know if it doesn't get at your question. Um, so here's an instance, I, I need to explain this for just one second to, to show you what it is. We had uh, two screens, this is the uh, Dublin Meeting House Square um, installation that we did. We had two different screens that we were flipping between that would switch, I think it was on the hour, or I, I forget exactly how it, um, when they switched, but um, basically there was a, a blue interface screen, which was this one, and then there was an orange one, which I don't have shown here. But each one of these, so, and this one was a two-night installation on Saturday and Friday nights. Each one of these dots um, just represents a caption that was sent in to the, 
to the interface. The blue dot is a caption that's sent into the, the blue screen, and the orange dot is one that was sent into the orange interface screen. Here's an example where, um, just looking at the blue dots, for instance, we had, you know, there, our last blue dot was up there. The last time there was a caption that was sent in was up there. Um, long space of kind of, you know, nothing really happening, no big deal. Um, next blue dot there is, what is it? It's about over an hour later, um, which I think it was up for three hours total. So it's kind of a big chunk of space to not have much happening there. I looked at the, you know, the log file afterwards because I was kind of curious. This is a seemed like a little bit of a weird blank space in it. So these are the texts that were happening, you know, after this blank space. Ban the ban. This is, you know, the smoking ban that's happening. No smoking in the projection box. Lovely. This is just sort of a, a little sample of what was happening. I'd say this is kind of pretty standard, you know, sort of joking text messages that were happening. There was nothing sort of super profound that was um, happening in this burst of messages. Um, so I went and looked at the one, what was, like, what was the last one before there was this big blank spot? And it tweaked something in my own memory of the, of the event. This is a guy who came along. So this, if you can't read this text message, there's a spelling mistake in it, but it's, it's cool. Um, my father died. This is to image number six, by the way, if you see this one here, which was one of the images that um, one of the kids took of himself who had really bad asthma. And he actually put white um, makeup onto his face and then used his, uh, his mask that he uh, has has to use when he has a lot of bad asthma. And he took a picture of himself to sort of, it was partly a representation of, you know, smoking is bad for me individual, my, my health. Um, but the guy texted this to image number six, which was my father died on the 12th of April. He smoked, it's the spelling mistake. I still do, it worries me, I'm his son. And what ended up happening was, it was nothing that was texted to this image later on. And you asked this earlier question about, you know, leaving up a text. Um, that you wanted to have left up and why that was important or not. We had a conversation with that guy for probably a good half hour in the space, in the, the installation space around, about what had happened, about his dad, about him, why is he still smoke, what is he worried about, he is, does he have kids, does he... There was sort of a conversation that happened around risk-taking behavior, around smoking, around what genetic factors were, but also this, you know, this wasn't too long after the 12th of April. His dad had died pretty recently. Um, so this is sort of an answer as well to say, you know, here's something, when you think about this conversation, it really was distributed among this thing that was happening on the screen, but also this conversation that was happening in the physical space in front of it. Um, anyway, that's a... I'm conscious of time. I want to leave enough time for questions, too. But So I want to um, actually, you know what, I'll, just because I think there might be a little bit of time, I'll quickly go. This was a, um, another sort of way of analyzing the data that I was, that I was doing, which was this was the um, installation, again, that we did on smoking. I got kind of billed as the smoking guy for a little while in the lab, which was weird, but I didn't smoke. Um, this is when we did in a train station in Amsterdam working with the computer clubhouse. And they, again, did this. Um, activity where they took a bunch of images around smoking. And what ended up, you know, there's a couple things that came out of this was thinking about what kinds of patterns were in the text messages and how this community under, understood itself. Again, trying to get back to this listening systems idea. One is that smoking is a social activity. So, uh, you know, maybe in an American or North American context, is it wasn't really this idea on smoking is something that's bad for your health. It's like, no, there was a ton of text messages about smoking being this way of creating community in this way of relating to each other, and when do you take smoke breaks, and when do you not take smoke breaks. And this sort of came out in the text messages. Um, these are just a sample of them. But the other is this idea of an age-related activity. So this is a, um, a machine that you in the Netherlands that you have to put in this little card that shows that you're above 16 in order to be able to buy cigarettes from this machine, um, which, you know, as a regulatory system is a little bit bizarre. There's tons of ways to get around that. But it created this, or it represented, I should say, this conversation around what things do we let people do when they're under 16? What things do we let people do when they're over 16? And what is 16 anyway? Like, what a kind of strange dividing line. Well, do we need a dividing line? I guess we need some dividing line. There was these kinds of conversations happening both in the text messages but also um, 
afterwards um, among the group. So this is just a, an example of another way of understanding this data is to say, you know, we can see some interaction design patterns that happen. We can see some timelines to see bursts of activities and see different patterns, um, time-based patterns. But we can also see sort of some qualitative um, notions of how this community is seeing this broad topic. Um, so this just kind of summarizes um, what I meant by, by a listening system in this sense. Um, yeah. Sorry. OK, the third, final, I, I think I'm kind of on time, so I think it's OK. Um, <clears throat> the final listening system. And again, I, you know, think of this conceptually broadly that I'm looking at. This is uh, my dissertation work that I'm sort of in the middle of right now um, at Stanford. And it's basically looking at the American press as a listening system, and specifically in a few different ways. I mean, one is I think everybody knows that there's this incredible economic pressure that's happening on the mainstream media. So advertising revenues are plummeting. Paywalls have really not been figured out yet. Subscription services have not really been figured out yet. And there's a sort of big question mark of what one, what kind of quality was the news that mainstream media organizations have been producing for a while? Are there economic models to support that quality of news? But then also more fundamentally, what are some different notions of the democratic function of the press? So um, there's the US Constitution, the First Amendment, has both a speech clause and a press clause. You know, one sort of simple question to say is, are these redundant anymore? Is, is online speech doing the job of the press enough that we actually don't need to think about an institutional professionalized press as something? It's this sort of weird anachronism from the time when people didn't have access to presses and didn't have access to the means of publishing for themselves. Or is there something sort of more fundamental or more uh, idealistic, perhaps, in this idea of what the press clause is? So this is a this project that I'm engaging in is thinking about the press as sort of an institutionalized listening profession. What does it mean to be a responsible press? And specifically, um, I'll, I'll show you exactly how I'm thinking about it. Um, and what I mean by the online press in terms of a listening technology or listening system here, one is in terms of techno uh, technologies, and I'll show you some examples of how I'm thinking about this. But these are uh, indices of content. These are uh, APIs, application programming interfaces that uh, non-journalists or non-specialists are using to interact with news content. Um, these are public commenting systems. When you go to a news site and you see that little box at the bottom that says, give us feedback, is thinking about who designs those and what that technology is. Um, the practices that I'm looking at here are this idea of what does it mean for a professional mainstream news uh, organization to solicit user-generated content? How do they professionally edit it? And what does the aggregation of that existing content um, mean? The ideals, um, this sort of last part here, is kind of the part that I'm pushing on most in the dissertation. It's, this is a bit of a departure from the, the previous work, but to really ask some questions about what the function of the press is, and specifically, um, what models of press freedom are being encoded in the design and use of these technologies? So it's specifically US press freedom. Um, so I want to set this up a little bit. Bear with me. This is like um, sort of the crash course introduction to like First Amendment <laughs> law, legal theory, all this kind of stuff. So I'll just, it's a little bit high, high level. Um, I should also say I'm Canadian, so the First Amendment is this kind of exotic thing for me. It's really great. Um, but curiously, so it's this thing that says Congress shall make no law. Um, dot, 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 if you, if you know the language, there's a lot else in the dot, dot, dot that's pretty controversial too. But this one is Congress should make no law abridging freedom of speech or of the press. And this is going to seem a little weird, but there's a, you know, a ton of ink spilled over whether or not the speech clause is redundant with the press clause there. So is something different when there's a mainstream institutionalized, professionalized press that regulates itself, but that has this constitutional protection? And the curious thing, you know, different from uh, a doctor or a lawyer or an engineer that is a professionally organized body that licenses itself, that does all these things, journalists have no such you know, need. There's, there's a, a history of professional bodies that have grown up around journalism. Um, 
but you don't need a license to be a journalist at all. And that's exactly how this ideal was thought of. You, you don't, this is a, a right of individual citizens um, is to engage in this kind of activity. So when we think about regulating this and whether we should be protecting it, you know, remember that it's a, it's a uh, basic fundamental protected freedom. Um, there's a way of thinking about this, um, and this ties into this listening systems idea, is that the press is part of the system of a freedom of expression. So it's not just a set of publishing activities, but it's a set of a broader um, idea of what speech means. And that means considerations of what's libel law. Um, do journalists have, be able to have access into locations that are uh, private? So you know, journalists couldn't just wander in here off the street um, and do a story about things that are happening here. But there have been journalists who've made that case to say that actually if there's a concern of public value happening in a private or a government controlled space, that journalists do have a right to this and that that right rests from this notion of press freedom. Um, these, these are you know, some of the core ideas, again, I can go into more detail, but the, the final two core ideas are actually a little bit controversial, especially in sort of a case of online speech. But this is what's been driving a lot of the scholarship and a lot of the research around freedom of the press. Um, the first is Alexander Mickeljohn, who's this um, uh, pretty prolific theorist on First Amendment law. Basically says for democratic self-governance, and I can talk more about what that means, but the idea of being an autonomous citizen who's able to make decisions about what it is you do or don't want to do, that kind of self-governance, what's important is not that everyone shall speak, but that everything worth saying shall be said. And it's, you know, again, in the context of sort of explosions of participatory uh, online expression, that's a, that's a fairly controversial claim that I you could, uh, there's a lot of follow-up questions around this of who gets to decide what's worth saying or not. But this is the, again, just working with the ideal of what the First Amendment press clause is. And it relates to this other idea that liberty entails both negative and positive freedoms. And that's, you know, really uh, broadly is this freedom from censorship. And that's usually how we think about the First Amendment, is this freedom from somebody imposing upon me some kind of constraint or um, blockage that is going to prevent me from having my, my own voice. Um, but um, Isaiah Berlin and a bunch of other scholars have done a good job of saying, no, no, there's actually this other element of press freedom or speech freedom, which is actually my freedom to hear. Because this idea of democratic self-governments, for me to make these choices as I'm going around the world actually requires that I need some exposure to information to let me understand what the potential consequences of my choices are. So that there's this freedom to hear as opposed to freedom to speak, and that the First Amendment ideally does both of these things. But I'd argue that we've kind of been favoring or valuing this freedom to speak idea a little bit more than we have the freedom to hear. And I think it's, I, this is the kind of stuff that, you know, I, I think is fascinating is, what would it mean to design a system where a public or a group of people came together and codified or encoded in some way what they thought they wanted to hear that was different from the speech that already happened to be out there. There's some interesting examples, um, news organization examples that are doing that um, that I can talk about later on. Um, Spot.us, if anybody knows that one, or Spot.us um, is kind of an interesting case where people will actually post uh, saying, I really want to hear a story about this topic. Nobody's writing it, you know, no journalist. I'm willing to put in 50 bucks for to hear this story. Um, will some journalist that's credentialed by Spot.us, will they write that story for me? And you can ask a lot of questions around 50 bucks. Uh, I don't know, is that the right amount of money for that story? I don't know if you offer too little, you know, are you going to get somebody quality to write the story for you? If you offer too much, are you just buying the news in a way that actually doesn't contribute to this idea of a public, uh, publicly shared information? But there's some models that are happening. Um, again, I'm going to maybe go through this a little quickly, but part of the other piece of the dissertation is actually doing kind of a review of First Amendment law in relation to freedom of the press. So it's, it sounds a little curious at this point, but I, I, what I'm purposely doing is actually looking backwards a little bit and saying, all right, how have, this, how have the courts thought about what press freedom means um, throughout all these decisions? Is there some uh, sort of inkling of value of press freedom that we kind of need to rescue? And, and I'm not saying rescue, I don't want to rescue the mainstream institutional press as this sort of um, you know, 
network of gatekeepers who weren't letting people do things. But what I want to do is I think a lot about whether there's an ideal of press freedom that deserves protecting. Um, so these are some things I talked about earlier. But the courts have generally used some language that has said there's something called the press and it deserves to be protected. This uh, right of reply was the sort of big landmark case by uh, Red Lion versus the FCC, but it was the broadcast rest, uh, press. So it meant you know somebody said something about me, um, the broadcaster had to actually give me time to respond to my critic. You know, and that was kind of a, you know, it might sound a little simplistic, but if you're a privately owned broadcaster and you're like, wait a second, I'm a privately owned broadcaster, why are you imposing your requirement that I have to give this other guy some other speech? Uh, opportunity, but you know, interestingly, the court though, the court's kind of all over the place a little bit on this stuff, and said the print press doesn't need to do that because there's there's this editorial judgment. There's something about being a print journalist that involves deciding what's worthy news or unworthy news, and that the court says we recognize the press, professional press, has the ability to do that. It's a kind of a bizarre finding because it actually uses this, you know, here we get to use a scarcity rationale which says the spectrum, there's only so many people that can fit inside the spectrum, so I'm going to make sure that everybody has access to that spectrum. Here, um, that scarcity rationale went away. I think today it's interesting to revisit that scarcity rationale and think about uh, attention, time, as some scarce resources that we have, and this sort of power to orient somebody to the news. I, I mean, I... I have my own Twitter experiences to tell, but I can, uh, you know, I, it's, it's this stream, you know, the word that's often used. Um, the ability to orient me within Twitter is something that I'm actually willing to think really carefully about who I want to let orient me within a, a continuous data stream. Um, finally, just there's this idea that the courts have also been um, kind of all over the map on. Federally, there's no such thing as a reporter shield law. So there's no such thing as saying, if a reporter is called upon to testify in federal court, um, the reporter cannot say, no, I, um, I gave that information under confidence and my source doesn't want me to reveal that information. <laughs> um, federally, you can't say that. You can't say, I'm a journalist, I'm special within a federal court and I don't want to testify. State laws are totally different, actually. In a lot of state laws, you can say that. Because, and the state laws are interpreting the First Amendment and saying there's this freedom of press clause. Er, there's some really early cases about what how this translates into online environments that again is sort of this opportunity uh, I think to, to make sense of this um, this mess that's going on. So the I mentioned earlier the commenting underneath news stories. Florida and Texas have said if you comment on a news story, if you just type a comment underneath one, um, that's protected under shield law. So there's no there's no right for the, the court or the government to intervene and say I want to know who made that comment or I want to know the text of that comment referred to somebody, I want to know who that text referred to. These courts have said, no, no, that's a shielded space. And it's important, and there's a long story about why it's good to have that shielded space, because it's a way to work out what truth might be. Um, Illinois and Nevada, you know, very compelling arguments, the exact opposite, and said, no, no, the press is something different. Online comments um, are not protected under the shield law. Um, I'm going to skip past this, because I feel like I'm now talking a lot. Um, which I know is kind of the point, but um, the other way to look at all this stuff of um, what the press is, is to actually think about the history of journalism practice. And this is maybe something to talk about in Q&A, but basically this idea of journalism as being a professional practice is a relatively new phenomenon. It's not something that's been, it's sort of this, it was a post-World War I reaction to a lot of the propaganda that was um, used by not just the American but UK governments to actually rally the citizenry around a particular um, issue of mobilizing for the war. And there were a ton of, uh, it, was, it was basically propaganda was in most of the newspapers at that time, but there was an appeal to say, no, there's this, um, there's this common activity that we all have to do. The professional press kind of responded and said, wait a second, I think we're being kind of taken for a ride here. All we're just doing is republishing the content of uh, the government. At the, about the same time, you actually see this rise of uh, professional relations as a profession as well, which is also saying, well, we've got products to sell people and we're just going to do a really good job of explaining what those products are, identifying needs, and so it becomes this need sort of based commodity structure where um, people started to perceive, is news something that has public value that, des that deserves sort of this 
protection, whether it's economic protection or, or legal protection, or is news something that actually is more of a commodity where we have to figure out what it is that people need and, tr and what it is they want, sorry, and feed that want. And you see this sort of in the history of uh, PR versus journalism. There's kind of this, this debate that happens. And you see schools divide over it. You see professional organizations divide. It's kind of curious. But what happened is in the, the press became this, and this is kind of a nice phrase that um, Tuckman and Gans both use, objectivity. The journalists, and Walter Lippmann was doing this a lot in sort of the 20s and 30s, just sort of had this physics envy thing going on. They really wanted truth. I mean, they just really wanted truth. They wanted to be able to say, um, this is a fact, we're done. So how do you end up constructing facts that can be used by the general population? Um, what ended up happening is journalists decided to think about themselves as a science. And there's a whole history around why that might be problematic. But what it translated into in sort of the 50s, 60s, 70s were these strategically, uh, objectivity becomes this strategic ritual. And these are just some examples of what I mean by, or what they meant by a strategic ritual. But it's, they're all basically how journalists distance themselves from a story. They're all about how journalists say, it's not my opinion, it's the world, it's, it's the facts. It's the world, it's an in independent reality that exists independent of me. One great way to do that is to report on opinion polls. You know, it's not me, it's some polling organization that says 48% of Americans dislike the health care reform, you know, whatever. It's a way to say it's not my opinion. Conflicting truth claims, it's just sort of a simple, you know, he said, she said, I don't know what the truth is, but I'm just going to tell you what these two people said. I'm going to back away. Attribution is saying, you know, it wasn't just a person, it was that person that said it. Added facts, I'm going to just go out and research a bunch of different kinds of facts, include them in the story, again, as a way of distancing um, myself from the story. Even this idea of an inverted pyramid, which has kind of this cool history of, um, it was actually from the telegraph lines in the Civil War, where, so the inverted pyramid is basically, you know, the important stuff comes at the top, and then as you go down the story, uh, you don't have to read as much, and you, you see news stories written like that all the time. It actually came from the uh, telegraph lines in the Civil War were really dodgy, and you just never knew how long the telegraph line would be up for at any given time. So journalists ended up having this little practice of saying, I'm going to put my lead, my big stuff, at the very beginning, just in case this line goes down while I'm trying to transmit this. So it's a, it's a curious artifact, but it's also a way to sort of um, let people read your stuff in a certain way. So you say, important stuff at the beginning. Beats, you know, these are things like following... Uh, police stations, fire stations, city hall, you know, that's where news happens. News doesn't happen other places. You know, you see very few newspapers that have a labor section, but you see a lot that have an automobile section or a business section. It's this idea that news is, happens in particular categories that have economic rationales. And lastly, bureaucratically requirable sources is, you know, when you quote somebody, you want to make sure that you quote somebody who is a senior White House official, not just somebody who has an opinion on what the White House is doing. Because then your story is great, you know, if you can if you can do that. Um, side note: journalists get around this stuff sometimes by actually, if you read really carefully, there's a lot of irony in how journalists write that's actually signaling to you secretly, "This is what I really think," even though I'm going to do all this other stuff. Um, so what I'm trying to argue is that these, this notion of press freedom that we've traditionally thought about in terms of legal theory and we've thought about in terms of these professional practices and that that's where press freedom works out, that there's kind of this new area in which press freedom is, is coming from and that's these systems that automatically process press public interaction. So all the stuff that I kind of referred to earlier um, and these are it's just a, a definition of what those systems are that I think I said earlier. And then these are just some examples. There's a ton of them and I bet you lots of people in this room um, have their own examples. But, you know, technorati is something which, you know, sits as an intermediary that sort of makes judgments about what the authority of a certain blog is over another blog. And there's some good evidence that journalists, when you, when you need, instead of the old man on the street interview, if you need to cite a blogger, you'll go to tech, technorati first, figure out who the authoritative bloggers are from technorati's perspective, cite that blogger, and it creates, again, this sort of um, feedback loop where, you know, the same people get cited, move up, an authority ranking. But it's just to say that this is a site where this kind of interaction is happening. CBC... Can they just make that up? Or yeah. Is this our, our measurement? The, um, there, there is, and um, people definitely would know a lot better than I do. I, as far as I know, it's not uh, released in detail. They have some comments about how authority is derived in terms of backlinking and in terms of how um, often the blog is updated um, and how often the blog is linked to. 
But as far as I know, the exact algorithm is is not released. Um, but yeah, um, this is one of my favorite examples of CBC, when it's a Canadian Broadcasting Corporation in Toronto. Um, feedback systems, there's kind of this um, strategic value in maintaining the illusion of public participation in a way on news stories if you're a news brand. When I talk to reporters there, um, when you know CBC first went online and got comments from people on stories, um, reporters were, you know, you'd write a story, a comment would come in, and there'd be an immediate alert that would say, you know, hey, somebody commented on your story. The reporters would orient quickly to that comment and say, cool, you know, this is somebody had a Criticism of the re reporting, they would go back and do it. And they go back and change their story. When I talk to them now, they say, oh man, there's so many comments on stories, I, I ignore them. There's no possible way that I can actually keep up with all the comments that are on my story. Sort of a professional distancing then from this public participation while still maintaining the ideal of it. Um, but what also happened here is the um, moderating of these comments has actually been outsourced to a group in India. It's not done in Toronto, where the main CBC online news source is. There's a set of guidelines that are given to this moderating group. But then, you know, there's a periodic review of how well the moderating's going. But this is sort of basically sort of outsourced image of public participation in the press. So I think, again, thinking about multiple sites of public participation in the news, um, yeah, I think it's worth unpacking some of these um, interfaces and saying. And finally, one of the things I'm looking at in this in the dissertation is this application programming interfaces of news organizations that you know make a lot of their data streams public and then uh, individuals can actually take these public data streams and build applications um, of their own. I think that's another site in which we're sort of seeing press public interactions um, going. So it's just a point to say that I think it's a kind of an understudied area, but press freedom is happening not just in the law where I talked about, not just in professional practices, but is also um, looking at here. This is just how I'm approaching the dissertation. I'm conscious that I'm running out of time here, but this is made pretty standard stuff of like, you know, make a model of what press freedom means today. Uh, I'm doing this case study to sort of evaluate how that model um, is being instantiated in this design of NPR API, and then revise that, um, that model. Um, again, I'm conscious we're running out of time, but this is some thinking that I've done on why this stuff matters. There's some appeals here to sort of what the press has traditionally done. Um, and also that the press has generally been, if it's been, um, had sort of an economic health that's waning, if it's had this sort of cultural legitimacy that's arguably waning, if it's had this legal protection, which is a question mark. These are sort of ways that the press has usually configured itself as a um, legitimate or protected space of activity. I think the more um, you know, issues like, you know, how is Technorati's algorithm working? Um, how does CBC's commenting systems work? What can I do through the API? What can't I do through the API? These are all sort of moments of control and moments of casting um, what this interaction means that relate to the press as a legitimate news source. Um, and then just this point of the courts uh, I think don't yet get this and that there's sort of going to be this interesting moment in the next, you know, at least five years or so where there's going to be some of these cases bubbling up to the Supreme Court and there's going to be some cases of how to do it. So, um, this is what I meant by systems that listen. Um, I know that this is, this is my attempt to sort of tie together some of these things about listening as something that's happening in this individual, small scale, private, uh, language play setting, but it's also this how do urban publics configure themselves, manage themselves, moderate themselves, what does it mean to distribute conversation on the screen and the face-to-face. -face? And then finally this idea of an institution as a listening system, which I think is sort of a, you know, a curious but I think arguably important way to think about what the press could be if we want to rescue it from sort of its current um, economic and um, technological thread. So anyway. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thanks.